Good afternoon, everyone. I am Rachel Savasic Luxton. I'm the Director of Research and Training here at the Dibbel Institute, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to today's webinar, Innovative Uses of Mind Matters to Promote Youth and Family Wellbeing. We're honored and thrilled to have Dr. Becky Antel back as a presenter, as well as Danielle Whiteside and Dr. Ashley Logsdon. Um, they'll be here to present on the topic, and I'll be introducing them in just a moment. But a couple of housekeeping items before we do get started. If you're having a hard time hearing us, um, the email invitation you got provides a phone number that you can use to call in and access the audio for today's session. So that might be something to try. If there's anything else technically wrong, um, you can sign out and log back in if you know that usually starts the issue when you just refresh or restart things. Um, it you know, usually makes a difference. We will be having everybody ask questions using the question box in the control panel. So if you just want to take a second to locate that, there's going to be about 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes at the end of this session for Q&A. So um, there will also be a recording of this session as well as the slides um, and any handouts that the presenters decide they want to share. Um, that will be available a couple of days after the webinar and a link will be sent to everybody here. So that covers the, uh, the technical stuff, but I do want to go ahead um, for anybody who is new to the Dibble Institute, give you a little bit of background about us as an organization and how we came to be. So on the next slide, you're gonna see a picture of Charlie and Helen Dibble. So if you're wondering where the Dibble Institute got our name, there it is. Um, they are the founders of the Dibble Institute. Charlie did a lot of work with youth during his retirement, and he saw a lot of them having difficulties around their relationships or when parents were having difficulties in their relationships, and the impact that that had on those youth that he was working with. So he had the brilliant idea to translate research into different teaching tools that could then be made widely available. So while we are not a direct service provider, we do develop these research-based practices and um, publish them for organizations such as everybody here um, and like those who are presenting for us today. So a little bit more about us and the impact thanks to the work that um, folks like the presenters in the University of Louisville are doing, and I'm sure many others of you on this call today. We are a national independent nonprofit organization. We have clients in all 50 states who are providing direct services. And last year, based on our conservative estimates, we believe our clients reached over 100 or around or over 126,000 youth. So we just want to take a second to say how grateful we are to all of you who are here, who are doing this important work with young people. Um, we just want to say thank you. So that's broad background and a thank you, but what guides our work, part of what guides our work is our mission. And our mission is to help young people successfully navigate their intimate relationships through important information that helps to build their knowledge around relationship building and other skills-based practices. We know that when having these conversations with youth and helping to um, kind of, again, promote this knowledge gain and these, these skills, that it pulls a lot of levers. So pregnancy prevention, DV prevention, mental health, job readiness, and so much more, which again will be highlighted um, in, in some of today's findings and, and conversations. The other thing that guides us are our values. And the first value that I want to talk about is that we believe in research. We are big believers in research. All of our programs are research-based, and we continue to strive for evaluations on our programs to demonstrate their impact and effectiveness. And with this, you know, that also means that we make updates to our programs when new information is available. And I really believe that you'll see this value is ever present in our webinar today. Another value of ours is that we believe in safe, stable, and healthy and nurturing families of all different formations. And this is our goal for young people to have these families and to be raised in these families. And lastly, we believe that relationship education is for everyone. All of us can improve our relationships and we make sure that our programs are reflective of that. So that's a little bit about the Devil Institute, but let's get to the reason you are all here on this Wednesday afternoon. Before I turn it over to our presenters, I do want to give a little bit of an introduction about who they are. So first up is Dr. Becky Antel. Um, like I said, some of you may have seen her on past webinar presentations of ours. She is a professor and university scholar at the Kent School of Social Work and Family Science and the director of the Center for Family and Community Wellbeing, which is a translational research center for the social sciences that specializes in research and program evaluation, training and professional development, and product development and child welfare. 
health, behavioral health and social justice. She's She's got a lot of accolades to acknowledge and she's quite impressive. So with that, I wanna keep going because she also has 21 years of faculty experience at the University of Louisville. Um, she served as PI, co-PI or evaluator on, evaluator on grants totaling $92 million. She has deep expertise in behavioral health, child and family well-being, organizational culture and climate, and implementation science for evidence-based and innovative interventions for a wide range of populations. She's implemented three foundation grants to evaluate key outcomes for Mind Matters, so we're going to see some of that work today, and explore adaptations and applications to various populations. She's also a licensed mental health professional with an active practice, so that helps to really keep her grounded in trauma-informed work. So that's Dr. Becky Ansel. We also have Danielle Whiteside, who's a research manager at the University of Louisville Center for Family and community well-being. She's been involved in the implementation and evaluation of evidence-based and emerging interventions for families and youth over the past decade. And she currently oversees the implementation of Mind Matters in Youth Centering in Louisville. Last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Ashley Logsdon, who is a research manager at the University of Louisville um, for Center for Family and Community Well-Being. Three times, you think I would have gotten it on the third one. Um, but she's been the lead statistician and evaluator for many of the center's projects since its formation. Um, and just completed her doctoral studies, and it seems like so. Congratulations there. Um, and the focus or her focus is on substance use and child and family well-being. She currently oversees the implementation of mind matters in justice settings and substance abuse settings in Kentucky. Um, and like we said, analyzes and disseminates research on the model. So that's a little bit about the um, presenters. And with that being said, I will go ahead and turn it over to them to walk us through the innovative uses of Mind Matters, remote use, and family well being. We'll see them in just a second. Okay, great. Thank you all so much for being here today. And we are going to go ahead and get started because we have a lot of ground to cover in a short period of time. And I want to make sure that we leave time at the end for questions. So um, as Rachel said, we are uh, running the Center for Family and Community Wellbeing at the University of Louisville. This is a fairly new translational research center. We've been in existence for about five years now. And our mission is to advance the well-being of vulnerable populations through the dissemination of evidence-based practices, tech-driven innovation and research. We address a wide range of complex problem, social problems. And really, we, um, our identity is that we are a translational research center for the social sciences, where we offer this unique opportunity to translate research into practice and partnership. We're driven by three sets of core principles or values, and those are that we try, in all of what we do, we try to be evidence-based, trauma-informed, and anti-racist. And that's just a picture of some of our team. We've actually grown. We started with zero projects and zero people, and now we have about 70 projects and 30 people on our team. So next slide. Uh, we do offer three kinds of services at the center, which includes obviously research and program evaluation. You're going to hear about a lot of the research that we've done on Mind Matters today, um, which includes today's research will really focus on the survey research that we've done, but we do a wide range of other kinds of research methods, um, focus groups, interviews, all kinds of, of things. Uh, the second division of the center is a training and professional development division. We offer um, a wide range of continuing education opportunities, but also training of trainers, training of professionals in um, a number of evidence-based practices and direct implementation of many of those evidence-based practices. Um, and you can see highlighted here, this is where the implementation of Mind Matters falls, but those are, we also have done quite a bit of work with Love Notes, another double program, and and a wide range of other EBPs. And then lastly, because we're a translational research center, we have an emphasis on product development, how we translate our research and our training programs into digestible products for the community. And that includes both professionals and the populations that we serve. Next slide. And this just gives you an idea across our four substantive areas, child welfare, social justice, mental health and trauma, and health and health disparities of the different projects that we run. Um, and our Mind Matters project falls primarily in the mental health and trauma division. Um, you can see we have a wide range of other trauma-related grants from SAMHSA, PCORI, and others. Um, 
but it also obviously impacts child welfare um, in that many of our youth have been involved in the child welfare system who go through our Mind Matters program and also the intersection with some specialized child welfare programs that are now working to implement Mind Matters as part of their interventions. Next slide. So just briefly, and I assume that most people are familiar with Mind Matters, this has been a program that Double has offered um, for a number of years now. We did present a preliminary webinar, but I was looking at the dates on my, my webinar slides from the first time that we presented back in 2021. Um, and so this program has been around for several years. It is an evidence-informed curriculum for people who've experienced trauma or adversity with two primary goals, understanding trauma and its effect on our lives and building coping skills across multiple domains. And so on the next slide, we just to give you a very brief overview um, about the, the organization of the curriculum. It's broken into six sets of skills. And so this, I love this program because it is very practical, hands-on, lots of skill building. By the end of the program, at the end of the workbook, there's a checklist with, I think it's 28 different coping skills that uh, participants learn through the workshop. And so it's just very practical. Also makes evaluation easy because we can measure acquisition of skills and use of skills long-term and how that translates to improvements in well-being. So as a researcher, I appreciate that as well as as a clinician. As a side note, I also use some of this content in my clinical practice and we've had a couple of partners who run group practices or private practices who have adopted that model as well which I'll talk to you about in a few moments but our skills are self-soothing skills which include things like breathing techniques vagus nerve activities mindfulness etc uh, the second set of skills are observing skills, and this is really very CBT-like and understanding and being able to name our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, as well as uh, understanding the connection between our minds and bodies and how um, those interact with each other. Uh, the third set of skills are relationship skills. Um, clinically, I'm trained or licensed as a marriage and family therapist. Of course, this is very close to my heart. Um, and this is really an emphasis on the importance of building a strong support network, building empathy through uh, effective communication, loving kindness practices, etc. And on the next slide, we have the last three sets of skills. So they're understanding skills. And really this is the part of the curriculum that focuses on raising awareness, giving a name to things like trauma, the different kinds of trauma, adverse childhood experiences, and other kinds of trauma, as well as understanding the impact that trauma has on neurodevelopment and then subsequently other uh, kinds of development and then related health behaviors and health outcomes. Um, the fifth set of skills are self-care skills, things like music, sleep, physical activity, and even an EMDR technique, tapping. And then lastly, our intentionality skills. So we know that one of the consequences of experiencing trauma is a foreshortened sense of the future. And so intentionality skills is really meant to build that part of the brain and people who've experienced trauma that has been um, negatively impacted by trauma by helping them envision and think about and plan for a future beyond just surviving the day or the week. And so I love this part of the curriculum as well because it really gets them thinking about um, and envisioning a very different pathway for themselves. So that's just an overview of the intervention before I jump into all the ways we're implementing it and what we've learned about the outcomes. I wanted to just ground us in a shared understanding of what is actually in the program. So next slide. So this is a little bit of the history of how we got to where we are. So in 2019, we received a double foundation grant um, to run an RCT on Mind Matters. We ended up with a sample size of about 103 that hit right in the middle of COVID. And so we ended up with about half the sample size that we had hoped for, but we considered ourselves lucky that we ended up with 103. And that was largely due to the fact that one of our primary implementation sites was residential. Hold that thought because we're gonna come back to why that matters here in just a moment. In 2021, we received a foundation grant from the Jewish Heritage Fund for Excellence. And that was to, um, to do community-based implementation across 10 partner youth-serving organizations. And uh, our targets, our, our actual sample size in that completed grant was 300. And then when that funding went out, we applied for a, a follow-up grant. 
and that is running from 2023 to 2025. We're doing continued community implementation expansion into the public schools, which has some real nuances in the city where we live. And then also adding a component specifically on racial trauma because some of our partners had expressed interest in that expansion and using some creative techniques like arts-based healing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Again, a target sample size of about 300 and we're on track to achieve that. And so all together, we'll, we will have implemented and evaluated uh, Mind Matters with about 700 youth. Next slide. So I'm going to be talking to you about, um, as this was advertised, innovative, innovative implementation strategies for various populations. And so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about our implementation of Mind Matters in the residential setting. Um, we'll talk about how that's been embedded in the therapeutic therapeutic milieu, how that's been organized and the impact it's had on cottages, if you're familiar with that structure and residential treatment. And then just this idea of whether it's uh, a required or an optional sort of offering in that residential setting. Um, the second setting that we're going to talk about is community-based youth serving organizations, and this has been implemented in after-school programs, weekend camps, and I'm going to give you an idea of the breadth and depth of the different kinds of organizations that we've partnered with because it might give you some ideas about who you might be able to partner with in your implementation of Mind Matters. Then I'm going to talk about school-based implementation. Uh, Dibble has continued to be a wonderful partner to us in helping to um, provide resources to support testing this intervention in a number of different settings. And one of the settings that was really of interest was school-based implementation. As I said, in our county, we have some particular challenges with our public school system with implementation because we're very restricted in our ability to do research. And by restricted, I mean prohibited. And so under the current administration, we have not been able to conduct any evaluation in the school system, although we have come up with some really creative workarounds that I'm going to talk to you about today. But we have had a lot of interest from the schools in just offering and implementing the program. Um, and we have supported those efforts um, with the hopes that and with the workarounds that we've designed to get a little bit of evaluation data and also changing an administration which is coming next year we will we'll have a solid foundation to be able to do wider scale um, evaluation and there's still a lot of lessons to be learned just from an implementation science perspective and then lastly we have some specialized programs that we're going to talk to you about toward the end today and these are programs that are under development and we will be able to come back and share with you um, some progress or updates on those in probably a year or two but one includes the racial trauma um, adaptation or addition that we were funded to do with jhfe which is still in development as well as uh, implementation for families families and children who are affected by substance use disorders and are involved in the child protective services system here in Kentucky. We have a specialized program called Family Recovery Court that my colleague, Dr. Ashley Loxton, who uh, may join us by phone as she's in transit today, um, can speak to, but we're going to talk about the importance of and potential implementation with that program. Next slide. So this is how we evaluate Mind Matters when we can get evaluation data. And so these are the different outcomes that we measure, the scales that we use to measure those, the timeframes, uh, and that varies with our uh, current implementation. We have uh, baseline, immediate post, and three month follow-ups. That's varied depending on the grant. And we do primarily do paper surveys because it is really hard. You would think kids love their technology, but it is really hard to get kids to fill out a whole survey on their phones or their tablets. And we actually just got this feedback as we were planning with some schools for implementation. Once you give them their devices, they're no longer listening to the workshop. And so um, we have actually done primarily evaluation that way. But you can just see we look at satisfaction, learning, skill building. Those are all part of our training evaluation model. And then we do measure fidelity. So we measure the extent to which they actually cover the curriculum as intended. And then outcomes include things like emotional regulation, well-being, personal skills, trauma symptoms, and resiliency. Next slide. 
So for the first implementation area um, that we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to focus on residential treatment. And we have a total sample size of about 110 youth who are placed in a residential treatment facility who have received Mind Matters over the past few years. Next slide. So one resident, uh, so this is primarily in two residential facilities. One was during COVID, as I talked about. The other uh, has happened in one of our JHFE grants. And we trained the providers within the residential facilities uh, to implement Mind Matters uh, within their therapeutic milieu. And that happened in a couple of different ways. One residential facility offers optional or self-selected groups. So the kids go to school, and then a couple of days a week after school, they get to choose which group they go to, as opposed to sort of the mandated parts of their treatment in the residential treatment facility. And this was offered as one of those alternatives. So they could self-select into the Mind Matters group um, as part of their treatment plan. Another residential program actually embedded this in their daily activities, and so this was just required for all of the kids that were on that unit that they go through this entire curriculum. And for them, it was one hour a week for 12 weeks. For others, it might have been two or three modules a week in hourly increments. Um, a couple of things to note, there needed to be very careful management of trauma disclosures because the youth were living together. So in this residential treatment facility, youth that were living in the same cottages were attending these groups and would often share some of their experiences and um, that can create some particular challenges for management. Um, there needs to be a plan, we learned very quickly, there needs to be a plan ready for debriefing and aftercare because many of the youth left the groups feeling triggered, dysregulated and needing additional support. They come in with extremely high rates of trauma. So I'm going to show you some of the data here in just a minute. You'll see their ACEs scores are sort of off the charts in terms of, you know, what we know about national averages and what we saw in this sample, which is why the residential treatment. Uh, these kids are all in the custody of the state and have multiple forms of abuse, neglect, and family dysfunction from the ACEs and mentors. And so they come in in a really... Um, vulnerable place. And so then when they go through this program, they often need additional supports afterward. Um, and that might mean connecting to individual therapists, making house parents aware of what they're sharing and learning. Making the house parents aware of what they're sharing and learning is also an important implementation strategy because then they can incorporate those coping skills into the therapeutic milieu of the cottage. And so, you know, when kids are having arguments or showing that they're dysregulated in the cottage, then they could encourage them to use skills from the Mind Matters program. Looks like we should do a breathing exercise or let's do our tapping or let's use this communication strategy we learned in Mind Matters so we can work through this conflict. And so it really creates a lot of opportunities for direct and immediate application of what they've learned in the program as long as you loop in those house parents so that they can do so. So there's some definite advantages to residential implementation besides just it helped us get through COVID so we could get implementation and evaluation data. Um, it connects to many of the goals and even the treatment model of residential programs. And so, you know, as I said, these residential treatment programs are serving kids with high rates of trauma with system involvement. They're in the custody of the state. And so they are the perfect target population for this curriculum. And many are implementing trauma-informed care models. And so this really is just very consistent with what's already happening in those programs and just gives some additional tools and programming for them to add. So as I've already said, there's a high rate of trauma among these youth, and we've talked a little bit about there's this opportunity for reinforcement of the coping strategies by the house parents, by the therapists, because all of that can come together um, as life is happening in those cottages. Next slide. This is a little bit of data, so you can see uh, it was... Um, about 50-50 in terms of uh, white students and students of color, slightly more uh, white students at 57%. Um, we had a, um, a large number of females in the sample, um, 84%. That was just based on, you know, which residential programs that we worked with. There, there were a number of kids who identified um, as gender minorities in the sample as well. And I didn't give you this data, but there were also a number of kids who identified as being a part of the LGBTQ community. And so um, additional kinds of trauma that may have been experienced. Um, 
based on gender and sexual minority status because of discrimination experiences, et cetera, beyond the 10 ACEs that were measured. So what we know from national data is that um, about 12.5% of the population has an ACEs score of four or higher. And what you can see from our data here is that 80% had an ACEs score of, eight, of four or higher. And so a very, very high rate of trauma experiences in this sample, in even looking at like the ACEs score of 10, which means they've had every single adverse childhood experience, 15% of the sample reported that. Average age in this sample was about 15.9. Next slide. And here's our outcome data. And so what we see is that coping skills go up. Uh, so that's the list of the skills that they learn in Mind Matters from pre to post. We see a significant improvement in their understanding and use of those skills. Uh, we see a significant decrease in PTSD symptoms. So obviously uh, kids come in with high rates of trauma, uh, PTSD symptoms based on the you know, significant traumatic experiences that they've had. And as a result of that, you know, PTSD symptomatology, we see a significant decrease in that. We actually see, um, and we also, I'm gonna skip emotional regulation and I'll come back to it um, because it's a little confusing the way that it's worded. Resiliency increases from pre to post, social competence increases slightly. General mental health symptoms decrease uh, and this difficulties in emotional regulation looks like it's going down, which is a positive finding, but actually the way that that scale is worded, um, that that was a, a finding of concern. And what we hypothesized, which you'll see when we get to the community-based data, is that that's likely because of the emotional contagion factor of being in a residential therapeutic milieu. Next slide. So some challenges in implementation in the residential setting. There were boundary issues. Um, people who would engage in what we call trauma dumping, so sort of competitive sharing of their trauma stories, um, bringing the breaking of confidentiality, bring, using those trauma disclosures as a weapon, emotional contagion, as we talked about. There's a high rate of turnover among staff in residential treatment settings, 85% at the two sites that we worked with necessitating constant training. We had COVID restrictions, so it made it really difficult for outside trainers to come in and support and also data collectors and then frequent moves for the youth in and out of the cottages. Next slide. So I'm going to shift now into talking about community-based implementation. So far we've served about 320 youth in community-based settings. Next slide. And that includes a wide range of community-based organizations. And I've named some of them here, but really the point of that is to give you an idea of the types of agencies. So TrueUp is an agency serving foster youth, um, as is um, Youth Build, which is an educational or vocational program for youth, also serves a lot of youth who are aging out of care. Um, Youth Build and The Spot both offer alternative and vocational programming for youth 16 to 24 who've exited traditional school. BookWorks is an after school program. The YMCA Summer Camp has been a site. See Forward Ministries is, a, is an agency serving African refugee and immigrant youth. Backside Learning Center is an organization for um, children of employees at Churchill Downs um, who are. Um, all um, in the Latinx community. And then Inspire to Be is a private counseling center um, that offered this in groups for youth. So some adaptations were needed for some of these community-based organizations. We did do some translation to Spanish and African language, uh, which included, so Mind Matters is available, the workbook's available in Spanish. We also needed to translate uh, the PowerPoint slides um, and have interpreters there to help facilitate the groups because, you know, just understanding these concepts of trauma, there's some cross-cultural differences. And similarly with the African languages, so C4 Ministries, the primary languages um, that are spoken are Swahili, Kenya, Rwanda, and French. Um, and so those were the primary languages where they needed interpreters for those use. Uh, another sort of interesting piece about that was that parents in some of these um, settings also wanted to get involved because they also 
um, had experienced a lot of trauma coming from their countries of origin or upon arrival. And so that became an opportunity to train not only youth, but also parents. For the educational and vocational programs, My Matters was offered as one of the life skills classes. So that would be the spot and youth belt. So they offer a wide range of educational and vocational rehab classes. And My Matters became one of the options in their menu. Um, so for the summer camp, this was a weekend camp option, and then for after school programming in the counseling center, this was offered as a weekly activity. So you can see the way this looked was very different from site to site, and that's important to keep in mind because obviously you've got a lot of different populations of youth who are part of this sample and a lot of different implementation strategies. Next slide. So. Um, we have uh, about 50% female, 38% male, and 13% gender minorities who are part of this sample. Um, it was a predominantly black sample, so 70% of the kids who've gone through the program in the community-based settings were black or African-American, 22% were white, and then about 8% were of other races. When you look at the ACES scores over on the right, um, and I've just given you the frequency distributions here, um, you can see that, um, Again, we are seeing a high rate of trauma, a higher rate of trauma um, than the national averages, but much lower than what we saw in the residential setting. So when you get to four or more, it's about 30%, um, 25 to 30% of the sample has an ACEs score of four or higher compared to, remember back, about 80% of the residential sample. So lower rates of trauma, uh, lower trauma scores overall. And then we've also given you the age distribution. This is an older sample because, um, again, we're working with those programs that offer educational and vocational rehab, and so that included kids all the way up to the age of 24. We do find that the program is well received by older kids. There's a couple of pieces in the curriculum that need a little bit of adaptation or at least sort of a warning or precursor explanation about the videos that are being shown. It uses the video clips from the movie Inside Out, which we sort of automatically assumed would be very off-putting to older teenagers or young adults and their teens. They actually really like the video for the, for the most part. Our residential sample had a little bit more trouble with that video because they felt like um, the problems that were problems in the video were given the level of trauma that they had experienced. So that's just sort of an implementation note or nuance. Next slide. So uh, we see here that um, for our community-based sample, uh, coping skills go up slightly, PTSD uh, symptoms go down slightly, resiliency goes up, social competency uh, stays about the same, general mental health symptoms go down, and we see, again, a little bit of a drop in emotional regulation but it's not nearly as dramatic as what we saw in the residential sample where we think there was some emotional contagion. It is still something to keep in mind. We can go to the next slide. It is still something to keep in mind as you're thinking about implementation, how you're gonna manage trauma disclosures, meaning sharing a personal story, setting ground rules around that, how you're gonna manage confidentiality, especially if you're in a residential setting and not going off and sharing people's stories in houses or cottages where you live together, and then how you're going to manage emotional contagion within the group and then the aftercare needs for kids that come away with some significant um, sort of trauma triggers from the discussion. So there is a there is a significant amount of sort of clinical awareness that's needed in facilitating this. Uh, and as I said, um, several one of the challenges that we've experienced more in the community-based and school setting, which is the next setting I'm gonna talk about, is that many of our facilitators are not clinicians. Um, and that can be challenging because um, they don't always know how to handle those trauma disclosures. And so we have, in all of our implementation, maintained um, fidelity pieces, ongoing supervision, which looks like you know monthly or quarterly check-ins with facilitators to process examples. We, in the first iteration of a JHFE grant, we had people going out and doing fidelity observations every time people were observing or every time people were facilitating, and then giving feedback to the facilitators facilitators if there were concerns. And so just some oversight is needed depending on the background of the people who are facilitating. 
Um, so our community-based challenges. Obviously, we've had some language barriers to work around, and it's not just a matter of translating or having interpreters on site, but some of the concepts, I was just talking to some of the double folks about this ahead of time, some of the concepts are difficult to translate. The concept of trauma doesn't translate the same way, it doesn't hold the same meanings, especially for some of our refugee and immigrant youth. And so that can be challenging to explain um, in, in that context. Uh, the agencies, you know, some of the other challenges that we've dealt with, we just variable schedules, so sort of implementing in 15 different ways, which can be challenging. Students come and go, so it's not like a school setting where they're kind of a captive audience and you have them for the year or the residential setting where they're a captive audience and you have them for a year. With these community-based organizations, kids come and go. So they may get part of the program and not all of it. And we have measured that as well. And that's an area for future analysis is the dosage. So how much of the program did they get and how did that impact the outcomes? It's a lot of diversity in the students who are served, which means there's a range of trauma experiences, ages, and needs, and being able to support facilitation of the program with that diversity of students can be challenging because we're really constantly having to think about, okay, what are these kids at this agency or community-based organization going to need compared to some of the others that we worked with in the past? Length of the program can definitely be a barrier. It is 12 modules, which is designed to be 12 one-hour modules, so some have offered this in a shorter version, not through the first double RCT, even some of the subsequent JHFE funding. We now have a six-hour or six-module version that um, some folks are using. Maintaining partnerships over time can be challenging because organizations, these community-based organizations that we've listed here and some that were involved in some of the earlier grants are great partners. And because they're great partners, they're constantly being tapped to be involved in new grants and initiatives. And so it's just this sort of like initiative ADHD where we've moved on from this thing and now we're going to try something else or there's this new financial opportunity associated with a new grant and so they're going to take advantage of that and so that can be a challenge as well. Um, I already talked about the fact that not all organizations have clinically trained staff, so they may need extra supervision, training, support around how to handle trauma disclosures and create safe spaces and uh, take care of kids after the fact. And then obviously with all of these um, variables and flexibility. There have been some challenges with data collection um, and just frequent changes. Things get canceled. We have a lot of weather here in Louisville for whatever reason and random explosions. I was telling them we had one of those yesterday and things. And so working around the schedule is always challenging. Next slide. So I'm going to talk about school implementation, and certainly this is a model that's been used for some of other doubles, other programs, and just other psychoeducational programs in general um, across the country. It's nice to be able to embed some of these youth programs in the schools because you do have a captive audience. There's a lot of natural connections to things like health. Um, or other sorts of, you know, future development classes. Um, but there are some definite challenges, and we specifically have had some challenges because of our unique public school system. We have, however, implemented this with 97 kids in schools to date. Next slide. So there are four ways this has been implemented in school settings. One is through the, what's called Friskies, the Family Resource and Youth Services Centers. Um, these ha have offered My Matters as after school programs, both to parents and to children, or intensive options for those who've been referred, um, a general option as like an after school program for kids. Um, it's been embedded in the classroom, in health, uh, in some private schools, in junior high enrichment or enrichment or the homeroom and house system. House system is basically homeroom in some of the public school or private schools here in Lovell. Uh, MHPs are the mental health professionals. So we actually uh, train 33 MHPs, mental health professionals for our public school system. Most of our schools have MHPs and then these MHPs have been offering this as therapeutic groups, either by referral or for target audiences. So we actually just met with them not long ago and we asked them the different ways they were configuring this and some have done it by grade level, some have done it by gender, some have done it by self-selection, some are specifically focusing on supporting refugee and immigrant students, which is expanding our need, I was just telling them, to translate this into even more languages or have interpreters available and so uh, that might be Somali Bantu. Um, or Arabic and you know we just have some other languages now that we're, we're looking at. Um, and 
a lot of these MHPs will do like school-wide assessments of need, school-wide needs assessments, and then they'll connect this curriculum to the needs that were identified. And then our last area of implementation has actually been at the university um, level, and we've done that in a couple of ways. We have, for the past couple of years, had um, summer bridge grants uh, from the Council on Post-Secondary Education. This is normally designed to be for kids who are transitioning from high school to college to come and have like a camp experience before they come in. The second year, we actually expanded that to kids who are, I call them kids, they're college students, young people, <laughs> um, I'm showing my age, uh, who are transitioning from the uh, to the upper division in social work or to grad school. And then we um, also in the past year have a SAMHSA campus suicide prevention grant and we are offering a wide range of UVPs including Mind Matters and making the direct connection between trauma and suicide risk. Next slide. And this is just a little bit about our school sample and what we know. So um, again, more females than males and about 11% gender minority. And then um, a predominantly white sample, about 68%, um, about 40%. Uh, who are racial minorities. The ACEs scores, you'll notice, and if you're paying attention to these charts on the right, the data tables, you'll see the sample size in the data tables is much smaller than the number of kids served. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute because we have had significant barriers with getting data from our school sample, and we've really only been able to get it from a small subsample from the private schools and from the university data. But overall, um, much lower ACEs scores and the age you can see is primarily, we're getting data from the high school students. Next slide. So coping skills improve, uh, resiliency improves, social competence improves slightly, um, mental health symptoms decrease slightly. But what I want to point out is that PTSD symptoms actually increased. And I want us to remember, this is still a sample size of about 10, because that's how many surveys we could get back out of 97 kids. Um, and we are really attributing this to the fact that the data that we got back was from the private schools. And for many of these kids, hearing about trauma was the first time anyone had ever put a name or a label to some of the things they'd experienced. We know the kids in high income families experience a lot of kinds of abuse and family dysfunction, parents with substance use issues, mental health, uh, domestic violence, divorce. There also is a lot of, you know, other kinds of abuse, emotional and sexual and otherwise, um, but there, there's less um, awareness of that. And so I think that a lot of this was an awareness um, effect of people going through this curriculum and then being able to put a name to some things. Next slide. So our biggest challenge has been the data collection. Um, and our school system prohibits research without intensive oversight, had to be have buy-in three months before a grant was submitted, which we never have that much runway for a grant submission. And even then, they often don't allow that um, after the grant is funded. And so for, since about 2020, with the current administration of our public school system, research has been shut down in our county. And so we're implementing with all these schools and doing all these great innovative things, but we can't measure it the same way that we have been able to in some of our other samples. So we did develop some workarounds. Um, and I didn't share that data here because it's really just been for our internal efforts and you know it's still pretty limited although it's getting ready to expand and that is that we created poll everywhere questions that ask about things like ACEs scores and the trauma symptom checklist and their coping skills they're going to use that are directly connected to the curriculum so in the curriculum they take the ACEs inventory in the curriculum they do a ACEs response checklist which is about their trauma symptoms and in the curriculum they indicate which coping skills are going to be part of their plan. And then we have them report that through Poll Everywhere, and we can passively collect that data. And the Poll Everywhere questions are embedded in the slide decks now. So we're using that as a workaround and hoping to be able to gather more information until our school system opens back up. There will be another change in administration next year, so we are keeping our fingers crossed. Um, the schools were very open to offering the program, but the parents were very wary of having their kids complete the survey. So it's a very low response rate there too. Um, and the trauma content was very eye-opening for some. And um, for others, there were some challenges because they reported, you know, it wasn't very 
very relevant. They couldn't really relate to that. Uh, the content adaptations that we've needed to do for college students have included short and ending giving further. Uh, we have this campus suicide prevention grant where we're doing, you know, offering all these EVPs that range in length from like six to 12 hours and everybody wants a one hour version of everything. So it's really just a, a teaser, um, an overview of the curriculum, but we're trying to draw people into the full version of the program. That way there's some unique needs of our college students like racial trauma. We've worked a lot with our student athletes dealing with the transition to adulthood and then needing to add some specifics around suicide risk because it is a suicide prevention grant. And then as with all of these, the importance of having mental health professionals on site who can manage risks. Not all schools have these resources, our public schools have, um, but we just have to be really careful that as we're implementing these programs in school settings that we have that on hand. Next slide. So specialized programs that are TBD, I'm going to tell you about our next steps and where we're going with Mind Matters. As you can see, we continue to use this in a wide range of areas. Next slide. So two that are already planned are uh, the racial trauma expansion and the implementation with Family Recovery Court. So as, as part of our second JHFE grant, we wrote in that we were going to develop a racial trauma supplemental module. And the, our community partners who wanted to work with us on that were really connected to the community of artists in Louisville and wanted to use arts-based healing activities to talk about racial trauma. And so um, we've done a lot of work around anti racism since 2020, we are a mobile um, and home of Brianna Taylor. And so our center has been actively involved in that work. And so there's some strong connections there. And then I'll tell you more about Family Recovery Court as we move forward. Next slide. Uh, so with the racial trauma in the arts, just briefly, next slide. Um, we know that there's a significant impact on um, the mental and physical health of people of color when they experience racial trauma and some of those things are just listed here and the kinds of things that have been documented in the literature for young people and um, some of the, you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD, self-esteem, stress, anger, etc. And on the right, hypertension and BMI and heart disease. Next slide. So this is important, and we also know that there's some literature that shows that art is a nice and effective way to facilitate conversations and healing around the experiences of trauma. And so we originally partnered with an organization called NOIR, the Black Chamber of Commerce here in Louisville, who had some connections to various youth um, audiences, whether they're you know, middle school, high school students, or even college students, and strongly embedded in the artistic, art, the art community, um, the artist community here in Louisville, and so we are working on developing those supplemental modules and testing it with not only that organization, but as you saw from our community-based sample, we're connected to a number of organizations that have a very high proportion of students of color. Next slide. So we're going to be convening a group of youth with lived experience to help inform the development of the module, the actual didactic content, as well as selecting the art activities. We're going to be engaging the local artists to help us uh, design the activities, and then we're going to be piloting that with agencies that serve predominantly youth of color. Next slide. And then this is the last implementation uh, opportunity that I'll talk about, and that is with Family Recovery Court. Next slide. Family Recovery Court is a specialized program. We, ha we currently have seven federal grants funded by SAMHSA, OJJDP, OVC, which is the Office of Victims of Crime, and Department of Health and Human Services to implement and evaluate this in 12 sites across the state of Kentucky. It is a, an intensive model for parents with involvement in child protective services uh, with substance use issues. Um, the majority of these parents have had their children removed and placed in out-of-home care. They work their way through three phases. The first phase is focused on sobriety. The second phase is focused on parenting. And the third phase is focused on independent living. Throughout that, they come to court weekly. They have intensive specialized case management. They get sober bucks, all kinds of supports, including community meetings, et cetera. But next slide. 
what we have found is that there's actually a really high rate of trauma among the parents who are in this program. Uh, for anyone that's familiar with the substance use literature, you know there's a high rate of uh, trauma among people with drug and alcohol issues. And so people who have experienced um, childhood trauma, adult trauma is significantly greater risk of use. Um, it's that concept of sort of self-medicating or masking trauma symptoms through the use of drugs and alcohol. Next slide. Then this is just more on experiencing childhood trauma and adult trauma impacting, you know, drug and alcohol use. Next slide. In addition to, you can go on, I'm going to cover this quickly. People get the point. People who use drugs and alcohol often have a significant trauma history, whether that's childhood trauma or adult trauma, and it has largely gone untreated and substance use is often kind of a coping mechanism or masking those symptoms or uh, mental health issues. Uh, so in terms of trauma and substance use treatment, we know that um, when people do get clean and sober, they often experience a significant spike in their PTSD symptoms because everything that's been masked through drugs and alcohol kind of sort of flooding back and at a very high rate of return to use among those significant trauma histories. So it's really hard to keep people in treatment because they're experiencing a lot of distress from PTSD. Next slide. And we see this throughout the substance use and treatment literature that basically people with trauma histories have a higher rate of return to use, lower rate of compliance, lower rate of engagement in treatment to begin with, certainly lower rate of compliance or completion of treatment, uh, and you know, lower success rates with achievement of sobriety. Next slide. The reason that's relevant to family recovery court is because we've actually, we have a, a fairly high rate of parents who return to use within the program. That doesn't necessarily mean they're kicked out of the program. Many people do also go on then to exit the program uh, because they're unable to maintain sobriety. But when you look at the bottom charts, we see uh, these are the ACEs scores. Um, and we added a human trafficking question. That's what that chart is about on the right. But on the left, the ACEs scores, the, the people who drop out of the program have a statistically significant higher rate of ACEs than those who stay in the program. And so we know that trauma is driving them dropping out of the program. Next slide. This is their adult trauma history questionnaire. So these are their trauma experiences as adults. And this was really shocking to me when we first got this data because there's such a high rate of adult uh, sexual violence, witnessing murders, you know, being robbed, being the victim of crime, all kinds of really traumatic experiences in adulthood. Next slide. These are their PTSD scores, next slide. Uh, and we can see that when you look at their PTSD scores at the bottom, their people who drop out have a significantly higher rate of PTSD than people who stay in the program. The good news is if they stay in the program, their PTSD gets better. And that's what the charts at the right are plotting. You can see the changes over time across the months and phases. Next slide. So the idea is that we are going to implement my matters with parents and also children who are old enough. Many of our parents and family recovery court have young children, but we're going to implement Mind Matters with parents in phase one as a way to help prevent return to use and dropping out of the program. In phase one, their goal is to achieve sobriety. They're in substance use treatment, many of them in residential or inpatient treatment. However, not all of these, and they get a choice about which treatment facility they go to, not all of these treatment programs are directly addressing trauma. So the idea is that we would come in in phase one when they're doing their substance use treatment, but not necessarily getting you know, direct education or support around their individual trauma and provide mind matters as a way to try to manage the spike in PTSD symptoms that often is associated with sobriety and overall to try to keep them in the program and help prevent return to use. So we've actually trained all of the team members in our city, in our, uh, our service region, and um, we're working on coordinating and implementing that. Um, Dr. Logston, uh, who may be with us by phone. Uh, this was her dissertation she just defended two weeks ago, evaluating family recovery court. That's a whole other talk if you're interested in hearing more about that. It's got great outcomes. But she's going to be helping oversee uh, the implementation of this in Jefferson. And then we have the opportunity 
Jefferson is one of 12 sites. The other 11 sites are all led by Volunteers of America, who has all of the other grants associated with this program. And with those sites, we, again, have the potential to offer this to both parents and youth, and Volunteers of America is always very excited to add more programming to the mix uh, at their sites. And so we're going to be working with them on that, which gives us the opportunity to do some rural implementation across those 11 sites. Next slide. So this brings us to the end, and I think I've left five whole minutes for questions. Um, so for those of you who came to the first webinar, the original RCT found significant improvement in things like trauma, social skills, coping skills, and resiliency. Um, these additional studies that I share with you today show similar positive outcomes with some nuances, but overall improvements in PTSD, resilience, social competence, um, coping skills. For some, there were improvements in emotional regulation, and then there's some interesting findings related to PTSD varying by the sites that we're going to look into more. Uh, and really the takeaway of all of that is that the site matters. Some of the differences we see in residential we think have to do with emotional contagion. Some of the differences we see in the schools has to do with public versus private schools. And so just a lot of opportunities to continue to explore this. And now with the addition of our refugee and immigrant youth, we have even more opportunities to continue to look at how the program uh, may need to be adapted and can be effective to address different populations. So this array of projects shows that there's a lot of potential with My Matters to multiple populations and contexts. It may require some adaptations to link format language and even supplemental modules like our racial trauma module or suicide content. And our team is going to continue to explore these adaptations and applications um, So we, and with both racial trauma and substance use, uh, as well as community-based and school implementation over this next year that we continue to have funding. Um, and in general, Mind Matters is um, an excellent program that can be used to target a number of different youth outcomes of concern, including, you know, trauma and all of its sequela. But uh, and then we've also written grants and are looking to expand and targeting outcomes like teen pregnancy, dating violence, and then substance use and suicide risk. So that brings us to the end, and our moderators can take over from here. If you have questions, that's my contact information on our website if you want follow up after this. Thank you so much, Becky. I, I love your presentations and it just makes me, as you know, you and I have talked so much, it just fuels that research excitement. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I appreciate all the work that you're doing and that your team is doing and you know, your job just kind of hits the ground when you see how much you, you manage and, and do day in and day out. So thank you for, for that. Um, I think one of the questions that came in, and I don't know if you want to expand a little bit, a little bit more. I know you started talking about it, but um, about the racial trauma work and the kind of plans for moving into that space with Mind Matters. Sure. So as I said, we have one of our partners um, really wanted to work with us around this issue of racial trauma because he was deeply embedded in the arts community here in Louisville and he had this idea because we've done some pilot work around that. I um, actually have some faculty colleagues here at UofL who've done some work around that as it relates to human trafficking um, and uh, Brianna Taylor and using arts-based healing exercises and um, sort of voice and other research methods. Um, so the idea is that there will there will be a two-hour supplement developed um, and the two-hour supplement will include both didactic material that talks about racial trauma, what is racial trauma, um, how does that impact us, and then moves into some healing activities that are very arts-based. And so I think the easiest analogy, we have another project called Truth-Telling Councils that was working with foster youth who'd aged out of the system to use arts-based methods to tell their stories. And for some, that looked like songs or raps for others it was poems for others it was paintings or sculptures and so there will be consistent activities that everyone does but then there also will be an opportunity for people to tell their story or create something that's unique to them and their own experiences and that's really how that's been envisioned awesome i also and you know i'm admiring how much you're able to keep all of these projects straight in your head <laughs> A lot of and remember all those nuances and, and details. Um, I wanted to just confirm, I know we had talked previously and you said there are some difficulties, especially doing research in the public schools right now. Um, so when are you 
doing any of the work in the public schools. I know most was on private schools. Um, and I know other organizations are utilizing Mind Matters in public schools, but I just wasn't sure. Yes, no, we're absolutely implementing in the public schools. We just can't evaluate it. So yeah. don't let us come yeah. in and offer the programming. And we're not offering the programming. That would actually probably also be problematic. We okay. have trained, there are, we trained 33 mental health professionals who are employees of the public school system. And those 33 mental health professionals are implementing in their 33 schools. Um, they're not all implementing. You know, you always train more people than you can actually get yeah. to implement. But Danielle is supporting them. We just met with another group to sort of re-energize and hear about what they're doing and what their plans are. And so it's definitely being implemented in the public schools. We just can't evaluate that, which hurts my researcher heart because of the So maybe, like you said, maybe, maybe one day and maybe one day soon. Well, I have another question that I want to talk with you about, but I know we're at the end of the time. So maybe you and I can, you know, chat for just a a minute later on um, but I do want to again thank you so much for putting this together for showing the various ways that Mind Matters not only can be used but is being used um, and, and talking about the research ac across those different spaces and obviously for just doing the work that you're doing because like I said massive um, reach and I will also always be self-conscious of the way I say U of L I'm not going to say the L part because I hear you say it and I'm like I know I don't say it correctly. Um, so thank you so much and thank to everybody being here today. Like I said, the webinar will be available um, in a, a couple of days. You'll get a link for that. I do want to point out that next month we will not be offering a typical webinar, but we will be offering a special training um, by Dr. Marks, the Hidden Biases of Good People. It's an implicit bias awareness training. I do want to say it's the second training in a three-part series. If you did not attend the first, that is okay. It doesn't mean you cannot join this one, please do. Um, and if you did attend the first webinar, this will be a um, unique one. So we encourage you to explore that. You can scan the QR code there or follow up with us at relationshipskills at dibbleinstitute.org. So thank you everybody for your time today and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week. Thanks.